The doomed destiny of Flight PS752 posed a serious challenge to a world mired by terrorism, authoritarianism, and international realpolitics. A challenge that must be held up to the free world, and this time the responsibility has fallen on the shoulders of hundreds of mourning family members who lost their loved ones. The Islamic Republic of Iran's history speaks for itself. Arbitrary executions, mass assassinations of dissenters, artists, activists, intellectuals, scientists and journalists. This trail of blood reaches beyond Iran's borders with hundreds of state-sponsored abductions and assassinations on foreign soil. Many of these cases were lost in the legal maze and some that found their day in court fell short of holding accountable those who were behind such heinous acts. Within hours of the downing of flight PS752, the Iranian government set in motion a machinery of deceit, lies and distortions. The crash site was allowed to be looted and vandalized. Personal devices were deliberately tampered with and many were damaged. Within five hours, the crash site was cleared by bulldozers and all evidence was destroyed. For three days, their official narrative was that flight PS752 crashed due to technical failures. Only under international pressure, the Islamic Revolutionary Guards of Iran admitted to the shooting, but they refused to act in accordance with international regulations. While the Iranian government was holding the black boxes hostage for seven months, Iran's security apparatus was busy persecuting, harassing, threatening and imprisoning witnesses and protesters, in some cases even physically torturing family members. A Human Rights Watch report raised major concerns highlighting the Iranian government's inhumane actions. The world faced an absurd situation where the very perpetrators of a crime were given the responsibility to investigate their own crime. Within months of the downing, the families formed an association and they embarked on the long and arduous road to justice. A road without a road map. A year later, flight PS752 represented an open wound in the sky. On the first anniversary, the association became a haven of support for the families. Mothers, fathers, sons, daughters, husbands and wives, cousins, friends and colleagues of the victims took solace in the community that formed around the association. The second year represented an even steeper road ahead for justice and restitution. Mr. Ralph Goodale, Canada's special advisor to the Prime Minister published his responding report that highlighted numerous unanswered questions and emphasized the inadequacies of Iran's initial reports. Mr. Goodale later remarked that Iran's final report was shambolic. After many attempts to connect directly, the association finally met with the president of IKO. In this meeting, the families expressed their deep concerns. Instead, the IKO and its members remained passive while the Iranian government breached every obligation it had under the convention to which they are signatories. The association held online meetings with Ukrainian foreign and justice ministry officials and learned that Ukraine is in dire need of concrete cooperation from Canada, especially its federal police agency, the RCMP. The RCMP refused to initiate criminal proceedings in Canada and cooperation with their Ukrainian counterparts was distant and glacial at best. On January 11th of the second year, Canada's foreign minister left office in a cabinet shuffle. The families lost an ardent supporter and champion for their cause in the government. On February 2021, Dr. Calamart, the UN Rapporteur, published an extensive report on her findings. The Iranian government published its final report in March 2021. It was no more than an attempt to whitewash their crime and shield their high-ranking military and political officials. Canada's Transportation Safety Board's director, Ms. Kathy Fox held a press conference that merely emphasized the lack of access to relevant information to make any meaningful conclusions. 
In March 2021, some of the victims' mothers held a protest in Iran under intense pressure by the Iranian security forces. By June 2021, the International Coordination and Response Group of Affected Countries issued their notice of claim to the Iranian government. This has been ignored even as we mark the second anniversary today. Canada's forensic team published a report in response to the Islamic Republic's final report. The contradictory conclusions in Canada's report were disappointing to the families. In June 2021, the association held a protest rally at the IKO headquarters in Montreal to voice their frustrations with the process and emphasize IKO's role in their plight. Despite advance notice and invitations, the families were greeted with closed doors at IKO offices. The IKO officials made no effort to meet the rally participants. While the association and its members were grappling with the official dynamics of their cause, the victims' family members were struggling to cope with their loss, grief, and lack of hope for justice. Patience is only a virtue if it fuels achievement, and well into the second year, the families remain distraught with the results. Since the downing of Flight PS752, many agencies within the Canadian government acted swiftly and compassionately. The Prime Minister appointed a task force within hours of the crash and government officials were dispatched to help the families. Financial aid, special consular services and other humanitarian measures helped to aid the families cope with the shock of loss and grief. The association quickly organized action groups to collaborate with government agencies to support the families. The association also arranged psychological support programs, writing workshops, and facilitated visa and consular services. In August 2021, the association organized a justice rally in Toronto in anticipation of the upcoming federal elections in Canada. Thousands of supporters gathered around Toronto City Hall in solidarity with the victims' families. By late September, when early elections took place in Canada, the association and its members were dismayed that Flight PS752 was never mentioned during the election campaigns. By mid-October, the association organized an information booth at the Frankfurt Book Fair in Germany as an effort to engage the international community. The spokesperson of the association traveled to Ukraine for direct talks with Ukrainian government officials. Various topics, such as the RCMP's lack of proactive engagement and the domestic criminal proceedings, were discussed. The newly appointed Canadian Minister of Foreign Affairs met with the association and the families. The association took that opportunity to brief the minister on their upcoming fact-finding report. November 20, 2021 marked a major landmark in the history of the association. The Iranian government unilaterally commenced their domestic legal proceedings under a closed military tribunal by implicating 10 low-ranking unknown personnel to further their agenda of human and systematic error. Their families and their legal representatives were denied access to the court files or any participation in the process. Distraught and devastated, the families in Iran courageously took to the streets to voice their protest and demand a fair and impartial judicial process that holds the real perpetrators of the crime accountable. Soon thereafter, the association held a press conference on November 24, 2021 to unveil their fact-finding report. The report was the result of close collaboration between the association's fact-finding committee and military, aviation, legal, investigative, and forensic experts. The association's fact-finding report highlighted the major shortcomings, new findings, and most importantly emphasized the urgent need for a proper investigation by an independent international body to reveal the truth. Unfortunately, Canada's Transport Minister responded to the association's fact-finding report as merely an interpretation of the facts rather than acknowledging the merits of the report and his responsibility to address the shortcomings in Canada's dealing with the crime. The media, however, took a more nuanced approach to the association's fact-finding report. Today, 
As we embark on the second anniversary of the downing of flight PS752, we face the same questions. Who ordered missiles to be shot at flight PS752? Why and by whom was the Iranian airspace kept open during a historic direct military confrontation with the United States? What happened during those early morning hours of January 8? Why has the Iranian government failed to live up to its international obligations? Who was responsible in dispatching lethal air defense units and with what motivation? Why is the international community credulous, if not silent, in the face of such inhuman acts of violence? When will this cycle of violence be stopped? The families ask, how much longer will this painful wound over the skies of Tehran remain open? We are the mothers of innocent passengers on flight PS752. Let us remember their names. Vladimir Haponenko, 50. Oleksi Naumkin, 42. Sergei Khomenko, 48. Katerina Stadnik, 27. Igor Matkov, 34. Maria Mikituk, 24. Denis Lichno, 24. Valeria Ufcharuk, 28. Yulia Solohop, 25. Mohammad Abbaspur, 33. Mochtaba Abbas Nejad, 26. Mehran Abtahi, 37. Maryam Agamiri, 46. Iman Agabali, 28. Mutahare Ahmadi, 8. Mohsen Ahmadi, Five. Ramtin Ahmadi, nine. Sakine Ahmadi, thirty. Mitra Ahmadi, forty six. Mahsa Amir Liravi, thirty. Farid Araste, thirty two. Arshia. Arba Bahrami, 19. Avin Arsalani, 29. Muhammad Hussein Asadi Lari, 23. Zainab Asadi Lari, 21. Amir Ashrafi, 28. Mahmoud Attar, 69 Roja Azadian 41 Ghanimat Ajdari 36 Mehraban Badi 18 Samira Bashiri, 29. 
محمد امین بیروتی 29 نگار برقی 30 شکوفه چوپان نجات 56 دلارام داداش نجات 26 مجگان دانشمند 43 علی اصغر دیرانی 74 حمید رزا جوادی است 52 کیان جوادی است 17 اردلان ابن الدین 48 کامیار ابن الدین 15 نیلوفر ابراهیم 34 بهناز ابراهیمی 45 شاهرخ اقبالی 59 شهزاد اقبالی 8 Our hearts go out to the mothers of flight PSM 52 victims. Some of them have joined us today to remember every one of their names throughout our program. Before we begin, let us honor the memory of the 176 victims and an unborn child in a moment of silence. Welcome to the second anniversary memorial of the dreadful downing of flight PS752. My name is Amir Ali Alavi, and I lost my mother on this fateful flight. I will be your host this afternoon on behalf of the Association of Families of Flight PS752 Victims. Two years ago this day, on January 8, 2020, the world lost 176 hopeful, lively people to an unimaginable act of brutality on board the Ukraine International Airlines Flight 752. They were children, students, young couples, entire families, and all around innocent people who were loved dearly and are now missed terribly. Today, we also commemorate the National Day of Remembrance for Victims of Air Disasters. We are holding this program to honor and remember all of our loved ones who we have lost. As many of you know, the association had planned for an in-person memorial this, this year, but due to the recent COVID conditions, we had no choice but to shift to the virtual format once again. Nevertheless, so many have joined to support us to put together this program today in such a way that would be deserving of the victims of Flight PS752. After our presentations over the next two hours, we invite everyone to join us in an outdoor candlelight vigil at the Melasman Square starting at 5 p.m. Toronto time. The vigil will be live cast online for everyone around the world who wishes to join us to light a candle in memory of the victims and share the, your messages online with the hashtag, I will light a candle too. Today we have the honor and privilege of having several respected guest speakers who will join us live online, including Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, Minister of Foreign Affairs Melanie Jolie, Transport Minister Omar Al Gabra, Minister of Immigration Sean Fraser, Ontario Premier Doc Ford, Mayor John Tory, and Ukraine's Chargé d'Affaires in Canada, Andriy Bukvich. In addition to our guest speakers, we, all, we will also have a statement 
from the association, as well as recorded messages from the families and the public for the victims of PS752. Then we will hear some very touching messages from the families of victims of the 1985 Air India bombing, the Ethiopian airline disaster, and flight MH17 throughout different points in the program in light of the National Day of Remembrance for Victims of Air Disasters. We are all united in our grief and a haunting question, what is justice? Over the past two years, we were deeply touched by heartfelt expressions of support by many artists from around the world. We were hoping that many of them could join us today, which ended up not being possible due to the abrupt changes in the format of our programs and COVID restrictions. We are delighted, however, that a renowned Iranian artist, Ali Azimi, could make it to Toronto to perform in honor of our loved ones. I would like to extend our sincere appreciation to so many distinguished guests from the Canadian government, parliament, and other governmental branches who have joined us today online. I also thank all of you for tuning in, tuning in to this virtual event and for keeping the memories of the victims of this flight in your hearts. Your support and solidarity have encouraged us and strengthened our hopes for justice. Lastly, I would like to th take this opportunity to express our sincere thanks to the families and so many friends who have stood in solidarity with the association over these unbearable two years. Your support strengthened our resolve to seek justice through transparency, accountability, and uncompromising struggle to find the truth behind this heinous crime. As we have always said, we will never forget and we will never forgive. I would now like to invite our association's spokesperson and president, Dr. Hamed Ismailiun, who will deliver the association's statement. Thank you, Amir Ali. Let us imagine let us imagine that we are faced with a murder. Let us imagine that when we wake up in the morning tomorrow, we hear that a mother and son have been murdered in the north of Toronto. Wouldn't everyone be shocked? The murder will be talked about every day of every week throughout the year, wouldn't it? Then imagine that the next day you hear that a mother and her daughter were murdered in Vancouver. The next day, a mother, a father, and their 18-month-old girl in Ajax this time. Then the next day, two sisters in Halifax. The day following that, suddenly, a family of four disappeared in Edmonton. A mother, father, and two daughters. Suddenly, the next day, 55 PhD, masters, and undergraduate students in Edmonton, Halifax, London, Toronto, Waterloo, Hamilton, Windsor, Winnipeg, and Vancouver are murdered in cold blood. They're murdered in the most vicious manner, cruel and without mercy. The day after that, 29 children murdered in the most, in, the, in many uh, Canadian cities. The day following those murders, a man who was supposed to take his grandson to soccer practice in Mississauga. Murder after murder, and not even limited to Canada, a family of four from Stockholm are murdered to a husband and wife who married three weeks earlier, murdered in London, UK. Two children and their mother in Germany. Most of them are of Iranian origin. 11 innocent Ukrainian citizens were among the victims. It seems as if all of them were victims of the same murder. When we look at the crime scene, we notice that they, they were murdered, their belongings looted, not even little dolls or books were spurred, and their telephones crushed and tampered with, even their wedding rings ripped from their lifeless, lifeless fingers. How would everyone respond to such atrocities? After the first murder, after the second, and after 177 murder, wouldn't you ask the federal police 
who murdered all these people? Wouldn't you ask the authorities to initiate, crim initiate criminal investigations? Wouldn't the entire country, even the world, be thrust into mayhem, fear, and terror, asking why, by whom, and how exactly? Then if they tell you that all of these murders were due to one person's mistake, or even that of 10 people, what would you think? Wouldn't you doubt your own sense of reason? Then if you hear that the, the perpetrator is a criminal organized mafia behind serial killings with a long history of murder, what would you think then? If you are told that you must remain calm because this murderous mafia might murder more Canadians and must not be provoked, what would you say? Or if you are told that if provoked, they might take more Britain's hostage. Then if you are told that you must be patient and the police will one day deal with the murder, what would you do? It might be even worse. If you hear that the murderous mafia is put in charge of investigating their own crime and they will soon report on their murders as judge and jury and even choose your lawyers for the victims, wouldn't you laugh? Would it drive you to madness? What would you do? Let us not imagine, because this has happened. This is what happened to flight PS752. My wife, my only child, along with 174 other innocent human beings and an unborn child were murdered in cold blood. They told us to be patient and we listened. They told us that all options are on the table and we waited for these options to be checked off. But now, after two years, we realize that our patience has not paid off. Canada must stand for justice, and it is time for us all to stand on the right side of the history, today, now, and with urgency. But despite all of our efforts, day and night, for the past two years, the RCMP refuses to open a criminal case. The Islamic Republic of Iran bullies Canada and refuses to recognize it as a legitimate claimant, let alone come to the negotiation table in good faith and with truth as their currency. Instead, we keep writing polite letters, one after another, and ask them to please take us seriously. In this country, where those innocent victims live lawful, hopeful lives, the lobbies and apologies of the Islamic Republic of Iran are busy with money laundering and interference, living lavish lives. There is no talk of Magnitsky sanctions and no mention of list listing the entirety of the IRGC as a terrorist organization. Everyone is watching us in silence instead of listening to the cries of the Iranian people, the victims of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Our patience is exhausted. Today is the day when diplomacy ends and justice begins. Criminals do not talk the language of diplomacy. Justice is not negotiable. The authorities must know that we will not relent with an empty, shallow apology or political gamesmanship. We will not contemplate any compensation before the truth and nothing but the truth revealed. We remain resolute in our demands that are clear and specific. One, we do not understand the delays, the delays in taking this case to ICAO Council. This case must be taken before the ICAO Council today with only one goal, and that is the truth. And it must, it must be reached with full transparency and accountability. Two, Canada's RCMP must open criminal investigations and initiate its criminal court proceedings without further delay. It must emphasize the terrorist nature of this crime. The only platform must be in Canadian, must be either in Canadian federal courts or the International Criminal Court without any interference from the perpetrators of this heinous crime. Three, we demand arrest warrants for every one of them, for the leader of the Islamic Republic of Iran, for the senior commanders of IRGC, for all members of their National Security Council. Ukraine must be supported to take this case to the International Criminal Court. 
Four, the IRGC must be listed in its entirety as a terrorist organization. Magnitsky sanctions must be implemented, and until they capitulate to the law, the Islamic Republic of Iran's assets must be frozen without delay. We must fight for Canada today. We must fight for human rights and dignity today, and instead of carrying the burden of shame, decades later, when the truth is inevitable, inevitably revealed, the burden of shame that comes with crudity towards evil thoughts and deeds that result in unimaginable crimes. Yes, evil begins with a thought, often deceptive. No matter what happens, we, the families, shall continue to fight, even if left alone with no support. All that is important for us is to reveal the truth and nothing but the truth. What we fight for and what unites us is justice, justice, justice. We shall never forget, nor shall we ever forgive. Thank you. Thank you, Hamid, for these strong and heartfelt, heartfelt words. I would now like to call upon our first guest speaker, the Right Honorable Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada, who is joining us live online. Mr. Trudeau, it is a privilege to have you with us today, and we are eager to hear your message. Thank you, Amir. Uh, thank you to everyone here today. Uh, thank you, Hamid, for sharing your words uh, and your strength and your concern and your passion and speaking so strongly for the families. Thank everyone for being here today. I'm happy to be joined with some strong voices who've been by your sides and connecting with you for the past two years, whether it's Ralph Goodale, our special representative, uh, whether it's Ministers Jolie, Al Khabra, and Fraser, whether it's MPs like Ali Alhassi and Majid Jahari. We have a team of people accompanying you through these difficult moments and working with you to achieve the justice, the answers, and the closure that is so incredibly important. Early January is usually a time when we look forward to the year ahead, whether we're going back to work or school, or just turning over a new leaf. It's a moment for fresh starts. But for the loved ones of flight PS752 victims, January 8th is a day of pain, of sorrow, of grief. Because on this day, two years ago, Canada lost so many people who were part of our country. Today, on the National Day of Remembrance for Victims of Air Disasters and every day. We remember those who were taken by unthinkable tragedies. Tragedies like Ukraine International Airlines Flight 752, Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302, Air India Flight 182. Tragedies that took sisters, brothers, parents, children, and friends. They were newlyweds returning home after celebrations abroad. They were students hoping to become engineers, scientists, or simply get their high school diploma. Doctors and teachers who were loved. Small business owners who gave back to their community. We remember all of them. Aujourd'hui, Je pense aux conversations que j'ai eues avec I'm thinking of the conversations I had with many of the victims' histoire, families. I'm thinking of the stories you told me. I'm also thinking of your strength and resilience throughout difficile. these horribly difficult moments. And I can tell you that Canadians are also thinking of you. You are not alone. We are here for you, and we will continue to be Whether here for you. Whether it's by honoring the memory of your loved ones with a scholarship program, or by developing a new pathway to permanent residence for certain family members, we'll continue to support you. And to the families of those we lost on PS752, 
for whom today marks such a terrible anniversary. Let me say this directly. I promise you, we will always continue fighting for the accountability, transparency, and justice you deserve. Flight PS752 was shot down because of the recklessness and complete disregard for human life of Iranian officials. We cannot allow that to stand. Now that Iran has failed to meet the deadline for negotiations, we'll be vigorously continuing with other international mechanisms for accountability and justice. Canada will stand together with the members of the coordination group as a united front, and we will not rest until Iran is held accountable. En cette Journée nationale de commémoration des victimes de catastrophes aériennes, on rend hommage à ceux qu'on a perdus. On leur rend hommage et on s'engage à poursuivre them, notre and travail de to continue our prevention work because tragedies such as this one should never happen. It is obvious to all that no country responsible for shooting down an aircraft should then also be in charge of the investigation. That doesn't make sense, and it needs to change. And whether it's stopping civilian airplanes from being put in danger or preventing accidents and terrorist attacks, we'll continue our work to keep people safe. Alongside our partners on the world stage, Canada is leading the Safer Skies initiative to improve safety and security of air travel worldwide. We've also created a new conflict zone information office at Transport Canada, and we're pushing for international reforms to improve investigation processes and transparency. The bottom line is this. We're making progress to create real change, even as we continue to fight for justice and accountability for the families of those who've been lost and who were murdered. I know this won't bring back the people who you lost. And I know that nothing can take away your pain. But let me say this. Each person was special and loved. They will never be forgotten. Across the country, your fellow Canadians are thinking of you, and they want you to know that even in the darkness of your loneliness, and of your grief, of your despair and your anger, you are never alone as we continue to stand with you as Canadians and as a country. Merci. Two years ago, families left on flight PS752 دو سال بعد از عشق ریختن مادر دو سال بعد آیا کسی می خواهد قسم را بشنود؟ همچنان در سپید دم هیچده ده ما انتظار از آن طلو که پرواز کرده ای از آن طلو که غروب کرده ای ای روشنای زندگیم خوشید ها طلو کرده برای من اما خوشید هر صبحگاه غروب می کند و غروب می کند و غروب می کند و من هر صبح دم به ستارت می نگرم و یاد و خاطرت را مرور می کنم هنوز باورم نیست چطور تو و بقیه همسفرات در خاک وطن با مشک های سپاه پاسداران کشته شدید و ما همچنان باور نمی کنیم چگونه با قصاوت شما را از زندگی و عزیزانتان گرفتند تمام روزها برای ما هجده ایده ما هست همان روز شومی که زندگی را از من گرفتند سرنگونی هواپیما کشته شدن اون همه جوان اون همه آدم های خوب مثل سرنگونی آرزوهای خودمه هر وقت خودم و جای اون عزیزانی می بینم که تو هواپیما بودن دلم خون می شود من الان توی شهری هستم که محمد زندگی می کرد و همه لحظات فکر می کنم اگر محمد بود چرا فوش می شود دو سال بعد از این فاجعه 
داغ نبودن شادی هر روز سکونه ما تازه تر میشه It's been two years since the day we were scrolling the doomed list up and down, praying not to find a familiar name. But today, there is not a single name on that list that's unfamiliar to us. هنوز با دیدن چشمهای ریرا، لبخند پونه و آرش در لباس عروسی، بی اختیار عشق چشمانم جاری میشه. همه شما ها مثل خواهران و برادران من هستید. دوستتان دارم. هنوز ما تازم که بیا دلتنگی امانمون رو بریده دوقه از دست دادن صده هفته به شیش از ایز هنوز تازه است دو سال میگ زده از روزی که این جنت کارای پر از نفرت و کینازش دو 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 شما از ما گرفتن هیچ کس با صفتی نیست حرف برای گفتن زیاد و زمان کم دوست دارم انقدر جوری تک تک سرنش نمیم پرواز زندگی کنم که نابودی قاتلاش رو ببینم دایه جون دوست دارم با هر نفس اسم تو فریاد بزنم. شاید صدام به آسمون برسه باور نکنم این همه عشق و این همه امید به یک بار نیست و نابود شده است همچنان حیران این فاجعه همچنان حیران این جفا رفتن شما رو باور ندارم تک دنی ستاره سو نکنه تک دنی دتا چش خون نکن تک دنی میشه نخونه بلبه بهار ما و نوشه بو نکن تا اوم داریم دلتنگ تانیم هلو مامان نو I am missing you because I didn't see you for two, two years با گریه گفتیم مامان توی دیگه من رو نمیبینیم پنداشتم حرفایت بچه بانست ولی حقیقت تلخ بود پس از گذشت دو سال از جنایت استفای پاسداران همچنان جنایتکاران پاسدادن هشت ماه نفرت من با اجرای ادالت و محاکمی متهمین عواملین این جنایت تاریخی اندکی آرام خواهد کرد نمی بخشم من از خون پسر قهرمانم نخواهم گذاشت دو سال گذشته پس چرا هنوز من بیتابم دو سال گذشته و دلتنگی من هر روز بیشتر میشه دو سال بعد و هنوز هیچ ادالتی نیست ما هنوز دنبال جواب سالمون هست هنوز خشم و نفرت و ناامیدی از عدم اجرای ادالت خفه هم میشه دو بعد از دو سال در سالگرد فدوان عزیزانم بیقرارم و چشم انتظار داد خواهد به کدام این گناه فرزند دلبندم و عروس گلم و همسفران نازمی بیدفاع را در آسمان وطن خود سوزندی چرا؟ به چه گناه اینو؟ صده هفته شیش نفر انسان بودم نه فقط یک عدد چرا زدیم؟ چرا برادر منو کشتید؟ چرا جون 177 انسان بی گناه رو گرفتید؟ چرا زدید؟ چرا کشتید؟ چرا زدید؟ چرا کشتید؟ چرا هواپیمای مسافر بری را با موشک زدید؟ آنها پاره تن ما بودند. نمی بخشیم و نه فراموش میکنیم. ما فراموش نمی کنیم. ما هم در کنار خانواده های داغدار خواستار اجرای عدالتی. نمی بخشیم. نمی بخشیم. نمی بخشیم. نمی بخشیم. نمی بخشیم. نمی بخشیم. نمی فراموش میکنیم و نمی بخشیم. پریسا اقبالیان 42 محمد الیاسی 28 مهدی امامی 60 صوفی امامی 5 مهدی اسحاقیان 24 ریرا اسماعیلیون 9 منصور اسناعشری 29 شریعه فقیهی 58 فائزه فلسفی 46 فراز فلسفی 31 آیدا فرزانه 33 شکیبا فقاحتی 39 مرزیه فروتن 37 دانیل قنچی 8 دورسا قنچی 16 
سیاوش غفوری آذر 37 ایمان قادر پناه 34 پریناز قادر پناه 32 امیر حسین قاسمی 32 میلاد قاسمی آریانی 32 فاطمه قاسمی دستجردی 25 کیانا قاسمی 19 مهدیه قوی 20 معصومه قوی 30 فریده قلامی 38 امیر حسین قربانی بهابادی 31 سوزان گلباباپور 49 پونه گرجی 25 سهرناز حقجو 37 بهاره حاجزفندیاری 41 صدف حاجی آقاون 27 مهدیه حاجی قاسمی 38 سارا همزهی 33 زهرا حسنی سعدی 25 شهرزاد هاشمی 45 پارسا حسن نجاد 16 سهند حاطفی 32 حدیث حیات داوودی 27 السا جدیدی 8 پدرام جدیدی 28 شادی جمشیدی 31 علی جواهری پی 47 محمد امین جبلی 29 محمد رضا کت خدازاده فورتی سعید کت خدازاده کاشانی توینی ناین So my name is uh, Sushil Gupta. I was 12 years old when my mother was uh, killed on board Air India Flight 182. My, my mother was uh, Ramwati Gupta. She was uh, 37 at the time. My father, uh, who was a scientist by profession, but uh, a natural advocate, I would say, he uh, started collecting names of the families and uh, he had, he had some type of forethought that he would need to do this. And uh, together with many, if not most of the families, at least in Canada, as well as some uh, in India and overseas in the U.S. and the U.K., he formed uh, the Air India Flight 182 Victims Families Association. My name is Bal Gupta. I am chair of uh, Air India 182 Victims Families Association on June 23, 1985. I lost my wife of 20 years at the time and was left with two boys, 18 and 12. My name is uh, Rob Alexander. I'm, uh, I live in Hamilton, Ontario. Uh, my father was uh, going back home to see his mother, who was back home in India, South India, where from. Uh, Anchanat Matthew Alexander. But people called him, his buddies here at the hospital, he was a doctor, his buddies always called him Alex. Uh, so that, uh, that was his name. Yeah. Uh, in my situation, it was both of my older sisters, um, that were on the flight. Uh, so I was 17 at the time and they were 19 and 21. My oldest sister was Chandra. She was a, uh, pharmacy student, uh, soon to graduate from uh, the University of Saskatchewan. 
And my 19-year-old sister was Manju. She was in second year med school, also at the University of Saskatchewan. So, so I was 17. And, um, you know, the tricky part for me is I was actually supposed to be on that flight as well. And uh, I had just canceled my ticket just days beforehand because I had gotten a scholarship to uh, attend another university program. And so we had canceled my ticket. Uh, uh, so, you know, one always thinks about that as well. I was uh, 15. My sister was two years younger, almost, not quite 13 almost. And my brother was nine years old. And my, my dad, I said, was 40. And my mom was 40 as well. So I'm 52 now. So it's a, it's a bitter pill to always think about, unfortunately, 36 years later. I woke up by a phone call from a friend of mine around 5 o'clock or 5.30. And uh, he said, OK, just uh, listen to radio news and I'm coming to your home very quickly. That was the way I came to know, and I turned the radio on. And I heard the news that the plane has disappeared off the radar, and they don't expect any survivors. One of the worst air disasters ever, and it's taken more Canadian lives than any other crash in history. Air India Flight 182 simply disappeared from radar screens off the coast of Ireland. On board were 329 people. More than 280 of them were Canadians. At least 86 of the passengers were children. It is almost certain that no one survived. Air India 182 Shannon. Air India 182 Shannon Reid. Link between that and the bomb which exploded at Narita Airport in Japan at around the same time yesterday morning. Police believe the bomb went off prematurely before the baggage was transferred to a connecting Air India flight to Bombay. Worst case of mass murder in Canadian history. In fact, the worst act of aviation terrorism in the history of the world. I mean, the short definition would be, you know, there was a flight uh, leaving Canada from Toronto and Mirabelle Airport uh, on its way to New Delhi. Uh, about um, an hour outside of London, off the coast of Ireland, a bomb that was placed in a suitcase in the cargo hold uh, with the luggage um, exploded. Um, unfortunately, all 329 people, uh, most of them Canadians and Canadian citizens, um, perished. Um, and, you know, since it was over the ocean, it was very difficult. Only 132 of the bodies were actually ever recovered. And so many of us, you know, didn't get the bodies back. I went to Ireland uh, at the time of the bombing to try to, you know, recover the bodies we could. You know, we only got one. Uh, in the beginning, there was virtually no cooperation uh, from my perspective. Uh, there, you know, there was, there was some, you know, if you want to separate those other parties, there was some investigation going on, but there wasn't much communication to the families. Um, but at that time, um, again, even when the government knew about bomb threats and things like that, that these guys were threatening to put a bomb on an Air India flight. And back then, there was only one flight a week. It wasn't one a day or one every two days. It was one a week. My 13-year-old my, my son could have policed it better. I mean, this was a completely preventable tragedy. Uh, CSIS had recently been formed. There was turf wars that were going on. They did not share information. Uh, they had, you know, quite strong evidence on people who were planning a bombing of this sort. Information was not shared. And as a result of it, you know, bad, very bad things happened. And the bomb killed 329 people due to the lack of cooperation. And then that lack of cooperation continued. So once the bombing happened, they basically were trying to protect themselves and not get blame. And so they weren't sharing information and that resulted in, you know, taking a very long time to understand what actually happened and any attempts to actually progress with the investigation. They just kind of viewed it as a foreign tragedy that they had nothing to do with, even though, you know, over 260 of the people were Canadians out of 329. Uh, but that's how the Canadian government acted. We, we were made to feel it was a, just a plane full of brown people that uh, no one cared about. You know, even Brian Mulroney at the time, he, he called uh, Rajiv Gandhi and, and gave his condolences, which is, is nice of him to do, but he didn't realize that uh, 
the majority of the people on that plane were Canadian taxpayers, including my father. You know, it took over 20 years for a Canadian prime minister to even meet with the families. Like, just think about how shocking that is when you have the largest mass murder of Canadians and the worst act of aviation terrorism in the world except for 9-11, and it takes 20 years for the prime minister of the country to actually sit down with the families. So, I mean, that, I think, just gives you a real example of how horrific the government was in treating the families. Um, around the 10-year point after uh, 85, so 1995, um, the, the then RCMP uh, officer in charge uh, decided that he would go and meet with all the families. And that's really when we started seeing a change. First, there were, they finally managed to get one person extradited from England, which people thought, many of them in the government of the day thought could not be done. But through some, there were some, I don't know what to call them, heroes or honest lawyers in the Justice Department. They managed to successfully extradite one person from England. They charged two other people and the case went to court and then finally in 2005 they were acquitted there. One was, I think the one who was extradited, he was convicted, but the other two were acquitted for lack of sufficient evidence uh, beyond any doubt. And even after the trial, though, when the families asked for a, a public inquiry, uh, we were denied by the government at the time, being told that there was nothing left to learn, uh, that everything that could have been learned was. Uh, 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 thankfully, I would say for Canadians, uh, as well as the victims' families, uh, the next government that came into power did, uh, so that was 21 years after the bombing, did call a public inquiry. I think we pretty much, I think there's enough fact and documentation. What It may not be all provable in court, uh, but I think there's pretty clear evidence of who the main actors were and what they did and, and activities of that sort. Uh, but they are still roaming. Many of them that are alive are still free and enjoying birthday parties that you and I will never get to go to. The biggest unanswered questions is, question is, who would the chief conspirators. They are there, they have not disappeared, and they are still running free in this society. Justice is to more or less, number one, give the true picture. Who did it? How it happened? how it could have been avoided. Two things, how it happened, who did it, and how it could have been avoided. Justice to us and many of the families meant a uh, fulsome investigation. That's a hard question. I don't know whether we will see true justice. Because in the end, it. Uh... been 36 years the people that were are responsible were responsible for this murder of 329 people and i do want to mention there was two baggage handlers also murdered in uh, narita airport uh that were in a related bombing you know for them there is no justice the people have not been held accountable they're still free um and that's very difficult to take as a family member uh after all these years that someone can get away with this you know second worst act of aviation terrorism in the world and still not be held accountable for it. In Canada, I don't think that we have true justice. You know, we, we have people that, you know, do heinous things, you know, and some people that know about it and condone it. If you don't say something, you can, in my opinion, you condone it.
Now, again, I would say things did improve, but it took like over 20 years uh, before we started to see some real progress in, um, in how the government agencies, as well as law enforcement of RCMP and CSIS, uh, working together to um, try to at least hold some people accountable for, for this activity. We are told, and, and, and I think we, we believe that uh, there is still an active investigation into those remaining individuals. Of course, 36 years and counting is a challenge to collect evidence, to collect statements and so forth. Uh, but uh, uh, I think we still have, many of us at least, not all, but many still do have faith that, uh, that uh, the other uh, potential um, suspects will be charged at some point in the future. I think the credit goes to all the members of our association who were behind us. But as I said, there were about 10, 12 or 15 people who did not give up in spite of the, uh, sometimes insurmountable, what appeared to be insurmountable difficulties. I think there can be healing personally, but it takes time, unfortunately. And, uh, but we will be there to support you uh, as we've gone through this. and. Some of us are still strong enough to try and help and support, and uh, we have we feel we have a duty to all of you as well as to all Canadians and other and 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 the memories of our loved ones to help. Uh, and if I were there in person, I would I would be there to give you a hug and not just let you cry on my shoulder, but to cry with you, uh, uh, to cry together uh, because we care. For your loved ones and the 176 people, please keep doing what you're doing. Keep fighting to get the truth to come out. Uh, and hopefully in your case, maybe the people that are held, are held accountable for what they did. And so as difficult as it is and as emotionally hard as it is, it's an important thing to do. That, that, that's the terrible waste of life at uh, you know, Air India and, and, this, and, and in your situation. Uh, waste of life. That's what it is. That, that's the sad thing. I now have the privilege of inviting our next guest speaker, the Honorable Melanie Jolie, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Canada, who is also joining us live online. Minister Jolie, we are all aware of the pivotal role that you play in the path to truth and justice for Flight PSM 52. And we trust that you take resolute actions on behalf of the people and government of Canada. Welcome, Minister Jolie. Thank you. Uh, bonjour à tous. Uh, it's a pleasure Good for day, everyone. me to be with you today, and I'm humbled by this opportunity to not only be with you, but to share your grief as we mark this very sad anniversary. Today, we join Canadians in remembering the incredibly special people who lost their lives to aviation disasters. Two years ago, the downing of flight PS752 tragically took the life of all 176 people on board, including 55 Canadians and many more with ties to Canada. The year before, the Ethiopian airline flight 302 crash claimed 157 lives, including 18 Canadians and again, many more with ties to Canada. In 1985, the terrorist bombing of Air India Flight 182 took the lives of 280 Canadians. To all the families and loved ones with us today, I can only imagine 
the pain you have felt and the pain you continue to feel today. My heart goes out to each and every one of you. Today is a day to remember and to celebrate the beautiful individuals who we lost in these tragedies. They gave so much as family members, as friends, as citizens, professionals, students. They had so much incredible potential to make lasting contributions to our society. À toutes les familles, à tous les to all the families, to all their loved ones who are with us today, I cannot imagine the pain that you have felt and that you continue to feel again today. I want you to know that my thoughts are with each one of you. Today, we must remember and celebrate the lives of the people that were lost because of this terrible tragedy. They were friends, members of your family, people who had so much potential, so much to accomplish as professionals, teachers and students. These people had their entire future ahead of them. Of those lost in the downing of PS752, I know that you're still reeling from this strategy and, and the lack of accountability to date. I met virtually with many of you in November and again yesterday. I've heard Ahmed, Korosh, and, and all of you, and I was deeply moved by your stories. Now, I share with you your pain and your grief. I'm impatient as you. And also, I share the strength of your desire for truth, for justice, and for accountability. And of course, we all share the same frustration. I know that all these emotions come from a place of love and great loss. I want you to know that the government of Canada, together with its international partners, Sweden, Ukraine, and the UK, is determined, and I'm determined, to holding Iran accountable for this terrible tragedy in accordance with international law. We have turned a page, we're opening a new chapter, and we will seek justice before international fora. We also are determined, and I'm determined, to doing our best to prevent future tragedy in, uh, of this nature, to remembering and honoring your loved ones, and to supporting each of you and your families. We have been on your side, and will remain by your side until truth, justice, and accountability are secured for this tragedy. You, the family, and loved ones of those who we have lost are the ones who matter the most. And as a government, it is you we place at the heart of our decisions. I draw strength and inspiration from your love, your courage, your dedication to seeking justice. I pledge to continue working with you and I will do my utmost to honor your loved ones. They will not be forgotten and their deaths will not be in vain. Now, today, and for the years to come, let's remember them. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. از زمزمه دلتنگی از هم همه بیزاریم نه طاقت خاموشی نه تاب سخنداری
دو کما ما عروسی نکردن معلومه که دو تا از خودشون بودن تمام اموال و چای ما رو به سرقت بردن رنگ به جنایت کار دوست رنگ به جنایت کارهای دوست باید حقیقت کش بشه حقیقت نباید دیر پای مصنحت دفت بشه من در اینجا اعلام میکنم اگر یک دادگاه بیطرف مستقل آزاد وجود داشته باشد من ثابت میکنم که این هواپیما را عمدن با تصمیم قبلی ساقط کردن می مقدم 33 رحیم کاتبی 20 آزاده کاوه 40 فاطمه کازرانی 32 فروغ خادم 38 اولگا کوبوک 61 امیل لیندبرگ 7 اریك لیندبرگ 9 میکایل لیندبرگ 40 راهل لیندبرگ 37 فیروزه مدنی 54 سیاوش مقصود لو 43 پریا مقصود لو 15 فاطمه محمودی 30 اولنا مالاخوفا 38 مریم ملک 39 فرشته ملکی 47 سارا ممانی 36 محمد جواد میانجی 27 محمد معینی 35 راستین مقدم 9 مهدی محمدی 20 هیوا مولانی 38 کردیا مولانی 1 امیر مرادی 21 آروین مرتب 35 سوهیلا مشرف رزوی 55 دریا موسوی 14 دورینا موسوی 9 پدرا موسوی 47 الناز نبیعی 30 فرزانه نادری 38 مهداد نقیب لاهوتی 44 زهرا نقیبی 32 میلاد نهاوندی 34 آرنیکا نیازی 
8 آرسام نیازی 11 فرهاد نیکنام 44 علی رضا نوروزی 19 غزل نوریان 26 آلما اولادی 27 رجا امید بخش 23 امیر حسین اویسی 41 اصل اویسی 6 فاطمه پساون 17 Our next two guest speakers are the Honorable Omar Al-Gabra, Minister of Transport, and the Honorable Sean Fraser, Minister of Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship. Ministers Al-Gabra and Fraser, it is an honor to have you both with us live today. We will first hear from Minister Al-Gabra and then move to Minister Fraser to hear his remarks. The floor is yours, Minister Al-Gabra. Thank you very much, uh, Amir Ali. Hello, everyone, and bonjour à tous. I want to begin by once again expressing my deep condolences to the loved ones of those who were senselessly, ki senselessly killed two years ago. I will never forget the day I met with many of you in the aftermath of the shootdown. I continue to grieve with you and remain steadfast in the commitment I made then to all of you. As we observe the National Day of Remembrance for victims of air disasters, we stand in solidarity with the families and loved ones of Ukrainian airline PS752, Ethiopian airline 302, and Air India 182, who continue to live with a profound sense of loss. You are always in our hearts. To the families and loved ones of the victims of PS752, our priority will continue to be to obtain justice and accountability. We are also leading the world in reforming the international aviation system to prevent similar catastrophes from ever happening again, and to ensure that future investigations have more transparency and oversight. We owe it to those who were killed on that day and to all Canadians. Today, let's remember the victims of PS752 and keep them in our thoughts and our hearts. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Sean Fraser, Canada's Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship. And let me begin by saying what a, an honor and a privilege it is to be invited to join you and to offer a few remarks, uh, which seem so small in comparison to the magnitude of the loss that we are commemorating today. I want to thank in particular the families of the victims of Flight PS752 for the conversation that we shared yesterday. Uh, it has been at the front of my mind. Uh, since the moment uh, we ended the meeting. This event, of course, marks uh, two years uh, since the tragedy, and we're here to commemorate not only the loss on flight PS752, but also Ethiop Ethiopian Airlines uh, 302 and the Air India bombing. In these disasters, uh, one of the things that has struck me is uh, when I try to put into, the, uh, into my mind the scale of this loss, is that the number of lives lost in each of these disasters is nearly the size of the entire community uh, where I grew up. Families have lost uh, mothers and fathers, uh, sons and daughters, brothers and sisters. Our communities have lost friends, neighbors, and coworkers. As the Prime Minister pointed out, 
Um, these were students, teachers, doctors, uh, business owners, people that we come across in our communities. And I can tell you in the conversations I have in my hometown in rural Nova Scotia, there are people you have never met who are affected by your loss, who care deeply about your loss and who grieve your loss alongside you. As we seek to establish a path forward, I'd like to let you know that we intend to honor the lives lost, pursue justice and support the families to the extent that we can provide some solace. Of course, we'll be establishing a memorial and advancing scholarships and taking other steps, but it's important and essential to me that we continue to celebrate the lives that have been lost so their memory remains many years from now. We're going to work to hold Iran accountable for the horrific act that they have committed. We're going to work with our partners on the world stage to implement measures to ensure that these kinds of tragedies don't happen again. But importantly, to demonstrate to the world that this kind of behavior will be condemned and that no person and no state is above the law. It is inexcusable on the part of any nation to have such an event take place. And we will not rest until we achieve justice and achieve accountability. And we will do whatever it takes to help support families, work to identify ways that we can support surviving family members, including by identifying new pathways for those who may be in Canada or another part of the world to become permanent residents of our country so they can provide support to you in the months and years ahead. To conclude, I wanna offer you my deepest condolences and give you my commitment, although we just met uh, for the first time yesterday in many instances. I can reassure you it won't be our last conversation and I'll work with my colleagues alongside you to provide supports and to pursue justice and most importantly, conti to continue to honor the memory of your loved ones and those who've been taken from our country and our communities. Thank you once again for allowing me to take part in today's solemn anniversary. Hello everyone. My name is Kimia Nazir. Today I am here to deliver my speech on the second anniversary of the downing of the Ukrainian flight PS752. I lost two of my family friends and also one of my schoolmates on January 8th, 2020. But this is not all. My heart goes out to all 176 innocent passengers, including 29 children and more to their immediate families and friends. Whenever I see the families of these victims in person or on social media, I feel very sad and speechless and it brings tears to my eyes and I don't know what I could do for them to heal their permanent wounds. We still cannot believe that this tragedy has happened. I wanted to let you know that I'll never forget the victims of the flight PS752, and I will never forgive those who took away their beautiful lives. I will always keep all the 176 passengers in my heart, and I will fight for them to seek Justice, thank you for giving me this opportunity to express my feelings on the second anniversary of the downing of the Ukrainian flight PS752. Thank you. A jet has crashed and the tragedy is being felt around an the world. An Ethiopian Airlines flight has crashed shortly after takeoff from Addis Ababa, killing all 157 passengers and crew thought to be on The board. airliner lost contact with air traffic control minutes after taking off from Addis Ababa to Nairobi. The plane was the newest version of the 737. It was just four months old. We know that 32 Kenyans have died, but take a look at these numbers. 18 Canadians have been confirmed killed on that flight. A CNN analysis of FAA data is raising questions about how Boeing could have designed a flight safety system on its 737 MAX, centered on just one sensor with a history of failure. Simple external 
device can get damaged on a regular basis. The MCAS system is designed to prevent a plane from stalling. It's triggered by one of two AOA sensors which read the plane's angle in flight. But if that AOA sensor gives an incorrect reading, the MCAS could activate, automatically pitching the nose of the plane down repeatedly. A CNN review of FAA records shows AOA sensors had problems on at least 216 flights since 2004, sometimes forcing pilots to make emergency landings or abort takeoffs. 42 of them happened on Boeing planes. Data from the flight recorders on the Ethiopian Airlines jet that crashed one week ago has been downloaded. Ethiopian Airlines say the black boxes show clear similarities with a Lion Air jet that crashed last October. Both planes were Boeing 7. 37 MAX 8 aircraft. Boeing has reached an agreement with the families of victims of the 2019 Ethiopian Airlines crash. According to a court filing, the agreement admitted that the 737 MAX had unsafe conditions. As part of the agreement, lawyers for the victims' families can claim compensation in the U.S. courts but will not seek punitive damages. آیش پورقادری 36 منصور پورجم 53 ناصر پورشبان 53 آرش پورزرابی 26 شهاب رعنا 36 جیوان رحیمی 3 رزگار رحیمی 38 Mugir Rahimi and Onboard Child. Nasim Rahmanifar, 25. Nilufar Razaghi, 45. Hussein Rezai, 20. Mahdi Rezai, 19. Saba Saadat, 21. Sara Saadat, 23. Zainul Abedin Saudat 29 Kasra Saati 47 Alvan Sadeghi 29 Sahan Sadeghi 39 Anisa Sadeghi 10 Mir Muhammad Sadeghi 43 Neda Sadeghi 50 Nilufar Sadr 61 Seyyed Nojan Sadr 11 Amir Hussein Saidinia 25 Pegah Safarpur 20 Muhammad Hussein Saket 33 Mohsen Salahi 31 Muhammad Saleh 32 Sajede Saraiyan 26 Hamid Reza Setare Koka 31 Sheida Shadkhu 41 Mas'ud Shater Khyaban, 31. Paniz Sultani, 29. Saeed Tahmasibi Khadem Saidi, 35. Mahdi Tajik, 20. Shahram Tajik, 21. Alina Tarbai, 31. Afifa Tarbai, 55. Daryo 
توقیان ترتیوان آراد زاری سونتین مایا زیبایی فیفتین سام زکایی فورتی تو وی نور فورگت وی نور فورگیف Thank you to all the mothers who read out the names of the victims. This was the final group of the list of the passengers on, on flight PS752. It is not easy. In fact, it's unimaginable to recite those names as a mother who lost a child. It is especially difficult to do this under the conditions in this venue, where the pictures of all of them are laid in front of us on the seats, everywhere, all around this venue, where they could be sitting today had it not been for this unforgivable mass murder. We now move on to our next respected guest speaker, the Honorable Doc Ford, Premier of Ontario sent us his message of support for this occasion. Premier Ford, we appreciate your support of our cause and thank you for standing by our cause for justice. Good afternoon. I want to thank you for the honor of speaking with you on this most solemn day. Because today we commemorate the second anniversary of the flight PS752 tragedy and pay tribute to the innocent lives lost in that terrible event. We all remember that day clearly as though it were yesterday. We recall the horror of those early moments followed by the anger we felt once we learned that this was not an accident, it was not a crash. 177 lives were lost, including 55 Canadians and six Ontarians. Fathers, mother, children, and many members of our post-secondary community. They were all among the victims of this most heinous act. The sense of grief for the families of those taken will never fully go away. The loss for many is simply too big. But as time moves on, we will continue to mourn their loss and cherish the legacies they left behind. And to honor them, we recently announced that Ontario was renewing the scholarship fund that was created last year. This fund will provide $10,000 to 57 post-secondary students in the province in memory of the Canadians lost that day. We hope the families impacted by this tragedy will find comfort in knowing that their memories will continue to be honored and are helping future generations of Ontarians. Thank you again for having me. God bless the memory of those taken on flight PS752 and may their loved ones find continued strength and resolve. For our next guest speaker, we have His Worship John Tory, the Mayor of Toronto. Mr. Tory, we do remember how you and your office supported the families in the past two years to hold our events and rallies as our city was coping with the pandemic. Thank you for joining us live today, and we are looking forward to hearing from you now. Well, thank you very much. And I want to thank all the people who have been a part of this today, uh, who uh, join all of us together in finding a way to pay tribute virtually uh, to the many lives lost uh, two years ago. Two years after the destruction, of the Ukrainian Airlines Flight 752, the images and the loss still haunt us all. Many relatives and friends and loved ones and colleagues were taken from us. I've had the opportunity to meet many of you who were impacted by this tragedy and to spend time with the families and with the friends of those who were taken. I feel the loss and it continues to motivate me to stand with you in support, but also 
in solidarity. These were members of our community who were some of our very best and some of our very brightest, people of all ages, many in the prime of their career, some just starting out in their careers, some excelling in academe. They were helping us to build a better Toronto and a better Canada, and they were gone in one senseless, tragic moment. Seeing their pictures and hearing of their backgrounds at vigil after vigil, it was, it was extraordinary. It, it left an indelible mark on me and, of course, on many of you, uh, many of you uh, who were uh, more directly affected than I was. We will remember them, all 176 lives lost, including the 55 Canadian citizens, 30 permanent residents, and the many more who had ties to our country. They left behind families and friends who are still looking for justice. Real justice begins when those responsible accept responsibility. Only when there is responsibility taken for this deliberate act of terrorism will we have a foundation from which we can achieve justice. And our job, certainly my job as Mayor of Toronto, is, yes, to support and to comfort and to continue to grieve, but most of all, to stand clearly and firmly in solidarity with you and with our governments until that responsibility is accepted and that justice is achieved. The grieving families and loved ones of, of all victims in both Canada and around the world deserve answers. They deserve that justice. And we must continue to fight for those answers and for that justice. In times of tragedy, we all come together to support each other and to be there for each other and to fight with each other and to stand with each other. And we will continue to do that because that's the Toronto way. That's the Canadian way. We can see it now. We can see it now how this works when we do this, when we stand together and fight together. While we battle the COVID-19 pandemic, we know how important it is to come together and support one another. We've seen it each and every day, and it is no different here. And so I encourage all Torontonians, and indeed all Canadians, to take time to think about those innocent lives. Think about those families and about those friends and about this gross injustice and about this act of terrorism. And think of those who continue to grieve and who will continue to grieve. Think about how you would be looking for that support and for that solidarity if this act of terrorism directly affected you and your family. Today is an opportunity to think about all those innocent lives taken from us and all those left behind and the scars this has left. It's, a, it's an opportunity for us to act in their honour and in their memory to achieve justice for them. Thank you again for coming together today and for giving me this opportunity uh, to speak with you and to share my thoughts with you and to, to try my very best to comfort you and to assure you that I will stand in solidarity with you as I have done as we go forward to seek that justice. Thank you. دو سال بعد بعد دو در هشتم جانویه 2020 گویی همه با هم سقوط کرد دو سال از این فاجعه میگذره و هر روز داغمون تازه دو سال از فاجعه یه ساقت کردن هم ما به اون شکل سپاه گذشته ولی درد نبوده مهران برای من خونه بادم از هم خونه نشد من این درد رو توی قضم احساس میکنم قضر رفتنت رو باور ندارم این چنین ناجوان مردانه از دست دادنت رو باور ندارم برادرم رزگار همه زندگی من رو هنوز رفتنت رو باور ندارم قلب من هر روز از دیدن ویدیو ها اکس ها خاطره ها شکسته میشه هنوز نمیتونم رفتن مهران بر روشتن بر به کچکی که با دخترم دیگه چرد بودن آیا چنین امیدی برای فرزندم هست؟ که برگردن زیبا ترین زندگی ها را زشت این موجودات روی زمین از ما گرفتن هنوز نمیدانیم چه بر سر عزیزان ما آمده دو سال گذشته و دلتنگی من هر روز بیشتر میشه برای شیرین زبونیات برای شیطنات های بچه کنن برای اینکه ملق بزنی و بگی رگا کن خاله چیز جز انتظار و شاخلار من بار اولاد با خودان جل ازنده 
Nəvələrim qapıdan yerələ. Bunların günahları nə məni gördünüz? Qan ağlayıram mən şəbanə. Bu sal az cənayət hollaq qoşlar əzizanımın ki, dər tarix sabıqə nədaşt nəqzəm. Bu sali ki, bərəyə həmi ma, bə dərd, bə rənc, bə əşk, əmrə bu. And there is still no justice for you. The world is silent in front of this cruel tragedy. Heç əqdam ya qızarış əməli از طرف دولت و جمهوری اسلامی ارائه نشد دو سال گذشت از روزی که سپاه عزیزان ما رو خواب کن کشید خاطر حفظ نظام کشورش از همون دقایق اول برای ما روشن بود که سران جمهوری اسلامی دروغ میگویند آنان کتاب آنهای رویا روی و آمریکا را نداشتند انتخاب سختشان را از فرزندان نقوی سردنی مانده از بعد جمهوری اسلامی دروغ گفت ما نفهمیدیم حقیقت فاجعه چه بود؟ ما هنوز دنبال جواب سوال اون هستیم و ما همچنان مظلومانه در آتشی که 18 دی ماه 98 روشن شد می‌سوزیم. اما همین آتش مشعلی شده که با آن راه را برای دادخواهی عزیزانمان روشن خواهیم کرد. گرفتن داد عزیزانمان تمه آرزوی ما آرزوی دادخواهی دارم. دو سال از جان شیرین عزیزانمان از راست راست. دو سال از جان شیرین عزیزانمان از راست راست. دو سال از جان شیرین عزیزانمان از راست راست. دو سال از جان شیرین عزیزانمان از راست راست. دو سال از جان شیرین عزیزانمان از راست راست. دو سال از جان با اون چه کمتر شد صبر و طاقت ما برای دادخواهی است ما هم به دنبال جوابیم جنایت بی جواب نمیماند حتی اگر سالها طول بکشد امید دادخواهی دخترم بهاره و 176 پرنده خونین با زندگی من روز مسئولین واقعی این جنایت مجازات نشدن تا دادخواهی واقعی از مصببان قتل 176 انسان بیگنا آرام نخواهیم کرد که جنبش دادخواهی تا محاکمه سران جنایتکار جنب اسلامی ادامه خواهد به امید دادخواهی همه عزیزان به امید دادخواهی زنده ایم و نفس می کشیم ما قاتلان عزیزان من را هرگز نمی بخشیم هم اگه شما قاتلین عزیزانتون رو می بخشیم خون بچه های مقابل معامله کردن نیست تا زنده هستیم دادخواه خون پاک عزیزان من هستیم During those six minutes and 42 seconds between takeoff and crash, no one can imagine how Captain Haponenko and his flight crew were struggling to save the lives of the, their passengers from the assault by the IRGC. The second missile robbed them of any chance for survival. We honor the memory of the Ukrainian citizens who were among the victims of this inhumane act. I would like to welcome our final guest speaker on behalf of the government of Ukraine, Mr. Andriy Bukovic, Charge de Affairs of Ukraine and Canada, is with us live online and will share with us Ukraine's commitment to getting truth and justice alongside Canada. Thank you so much for being with us, Mr. Bukovic. The floor is yours. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much for having me, for letting me share your sorrow. Uh, two, year, two years have passed since the tragic date when Iran shot down Ukraine International Airlines flying PS752, killing all passengers and crew members on board. They were somebody's parents, sons, and daughters. They were brothers and sisters, partners and friends, just kids. They were innocent souls. But to, to this day, Iran has not accepted its international law responsibility for this crime, nor it has not dared to name all those name who gave orders and pulled the trigger. We have repeatedly urged Iran to engage in inter negotiations in multilateral format, together with representatives of all affected countries, including Ukraine, Canada, Sweden, and the United Kingdom to discuss the losses in court, repatriations, payments, and other issues. As of today, Iran has responded that it sees no point in further talks with the group of countries. 
Thus, thus, Iran keeps on evading its obligations under international law. It avoids paying full repar reparations for its actions. We are truly convinced that to ensure justice, the issues of reparations must be discussed with Iran by the entire group of affected states. United we stand, all together with families of the victims. We, Ukraine and other states, take a unified position. We speak with one voice and remain committed to bring Iran to account for its wrongdoings. For the inaction of its civil officials and military command that led to the illegal downing of the flight PS752. Together, we will eventually ensure that Iran pays in full due reparations for its violations of international law. We will never forget this tragedy, tragedy and will always stand by the families of the victims. They, and actually we are all, deserve transparency, accountability of perpetrators and justice. Thank you. My name is Anton, Anton Kotte. I lost three of my kids in the disaster with the MH17. My oldest son, Oscar, his wife, Miranda, and our youngest grandchild, Remco. I ran to the television and I saw there was already a live broadcasting by the Dutch News Association that uh, MH17 was shot down in the east of Ukraine. And we immediately realized our kids were in that plane. A Malaysia Airlines flight crashed in eastern Ukraine near the Russian border just hours ago. Ukrainian officials say it may have been shot down, possibly by Russian-made weapons. Flight MH17 had taken off from Amsterdam, heading to the Malaysian capital Kuala Lumpur. It disappeared from radar screens four hours later over the village of Grabovo. The coming up days were very confusing to us because you do hope the flight was overbooked, so they had passed the flight to another flight, but nevertheless, that was not the reality. And uh, we had a lot of uh, problems to get information from the, the, the airlines, from the uh, Dutch Minister of Justice and, and Security, about the passengers list. There was no passengers list. And at the end, I called Malaysian Airways myself on Friday night. And in five minutes, I got the right answer that I knew they were on board of that plane. That journey tragically ended here, in a field in eastern Ukraine, in territory held by pro-Russian separatists. All 298 people on board lost their lives, most of them Dutch, and as many as 80 children. Now, after years of investigations, a court here in the Netherlands is determined to find out what exactly happened on that fateful day in 2014, and also who is responsible. Evidence points to a Buk anti-aircraft system which was moved from Russia into rebel territory, controlled by pro-Russian separatists. Well, I do hope that the judge in the Netherlands will come to a verdict. Will come to a verdict. And that verdict Guilty or not guilty will be the start of a new, on a new political level that our Dutch country can make in the world. You see what they did, so there we have to count with it. And I'm not so interested in, in those four, those four uh, uh, suspects, but because they, those four are uh, uh, the people of the, of the, the mid-level, the mid-level. But we have also the people on the top level, the politician, and the, the, the people on the spot, the lower level, you know. Eh? And I do hope that this verdict will help that the, politi the politician, the uh, politics people can uh, um, make acquaintance again about this verdict worldwide to get the higher pressure to Russia, to the Russian Federation, of course. And on the other hand, we already knew that the public prosecutor is still investigating to look for more persons who are accountable for this whole disaster. And they have, they have already names, but the problem is they can't prove it. Our prime minister, Mr. Mark Rutte, has always said, 
the top of my list to do is MH17, and he's still prime minister, and he will be hopes to prime minister again next year. So we have a lot of support from the prime minister, the minister of foreign affairs, and the minister of justice and safety. And those three, we have to make a phone call and it will be arranged. If you want to manage a new activity, we immediately get all the guts to do that, financial or with the support from the, the national government. But what it has to do with foreign affairs, for instance, then we have to deal with many other interests. We have a lot of common in this whole, this whole disaster because both we have to do with, with a war situation. Both we have to do with a war situation. With a different outcome, but it's in the basic, it's the same, uh, Hammond. And, and, and that bothers me because uh, I can't realize that today it's possible that they shoot out a, 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 an airplane with passengers in it, but has no any part in a, in a war situation. You know? I was so astonished that there are still leaders in the world who don't deserve to be leader of a country, you know? because they had different goals and had nothing to do for their own people. They only want more power, more power for themselves. You know? I would like to uh, to read a death poem for the next of kin in Canada and their victims. So near, but so far away. No. Parting you do, you do not. As long we are here, you will stay. Parting is not sneaking out of the house, closing the door softly behind your existence and not returning. You are staying because you are expected. Your parting will consist as staying. We are not waiting for you because you are still there. Nobody says goodbye because you are not leaving. That's what I want to say to you and all the next of skin to the tribute to your victims. Hi, this is Ali Azimi. I'm recording this video in my isolation due to COVID restrictions. So I have to apologize to all of you for all the imperfections of this video, including my own voice. <laughs> تو شهر 
پیمون آخ بمیرم چشم ستاره کور شده برگ درخت باقمون زباله سپور شده مسافر امیدمون رفته از اینجا دور شده کاش تو فضای چشممون پیدا بشه یه شاپره به ما که خسته این بگه خونه بار کدو خونه یه بار کدوم وره 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 نازش میکنن سنگ سیاه حقه رو مهر نمازش میکنن آخر خط که میرسیم خط و درازش میکنن آهای فلک که گردنت از هممون بلندتر به ما که خسته این بگو Also in Iran, a renowned environmental activist and professor, Kavu Saeed Imami, has died while in prison. It is the latest in a recent string of detainee deaths. Imami is Iranian and a Canadian national. He was detained and charged with espionage by the Iranian government last month, along with several other environmental activists. Iranian authorities say he killed himself, distraught over his own confession and statements against him. But grieving family and friends alike here in Canada doubt that account. This this was a very happy, content uh, man. Uh, you know, loved his wife. Uh, you know, loved his country. Loved his work. I think there's every reason to believe that we're faced with a cover up here. Uh, Alex Neve of Amnesty International says the rush to declare Syed Imami's death a suicide is the first in many clues things aren't as they seem. Two days after the funeral, they they had the audacity to show on the IRIB, which is obviously run by the Iranian regime, a propaganda documentary or film where they are now laying all these accusations, how they caught this group of spies and without any kind of evidence. This is two days after his funeral, you know, after he died. So not only are you not taking any responsibility or trying to acknowledge and admit the mistakes you met, made, but doubling down and then attacking my father when he was dead and when he, he could no longer defend himself. In all instances, the Iranian government has refused to allow any kind of independent review or investigation. And now with Dr. Sayyid Imami, the family is under pressure that if they want to get his body back, uh, they have to agree that there will be no independent autopsy of any kind. 
we never really um, heard from RCMP in any way, and we um, we had no idea uh, how they could help, or whether they want to help, or uh, whether they were involved or not, whether they wanted to keep us safe after coming back to Canada. We have no clue. We call on the Iranian government to conduct a thorough and transparent investigation into this, uh, into this, into this death, into his death. We, on behalf of the Canadian government, we are asking for answers, Mr. Speaker. Iran's notorious Evin prison was built during the time of the Shah to hold maybe 300 people. That ballooned to 15,000 after the Islamic Revolution. Other prominent Iranian Canadians who've done time there include journalist Maziar Bahari, who says he was tortured repeatedly before his release. And then there's photojournalist Zara Kazemi. Photojournalist Zara Kazemi was taking pictures at a demonstration in Tehran. She was arrested, beaten, and tortured in custody. The doctor attending her death said she'd been brutally raped. They brought her in on a stretcher. Speaking through a translator, Sharam Azam, was blunt. Uh, it was the first time that I saw somebody who was being tortured. Uh, it was so shocking for me. Azam went on. Her nose had been broken. She'd vomited blood. Her left eardrum ruptured. Bruises on her face, her ribs, her abdomen. Deep scratches on the back of her neck. One of her toes had been, in his words, completely smashed. And a big legal battle is set to begin in Montreal today. The son of Zara Kazmi is suing Iran for the arrest, torture and death of his mother in 2003. Well, the, the problem, in, in a sense, has always been the State Immunity Act, which essentially prevents any Canadian from suing a foreign government. Now, the Canadian government had intervened, and intervened uh, because they were concerned that if Hashemi won this case, that Canada would lose immunity abroad and also hurt relations as well. Supreme Court of Canada says that the State Immunity Act is constitutional uh, and prohibits any civil lawsuits against a foreign country from proceeding. So in this case, it, you cannot sue Iran or the Iranian the officials. can change the laws if it chooses to do so. If these types of cases come forward again and people like Kazemi's son want to sue a foreign country, the laws will have to be changed. During this time, we had conversations with GAC, Global Affairs Canada, but to be honest, we never felt that much support. We never felt that we were being heard. Um, we never felt fully acknowledged, supported. We had to chase them often to see what happened rather than them being proactive and giving us constant updates. And so it was very incredibly frustrating just to see what is our country doing for us? Justice, that's a hard question. Um, what is justice for us? The Iranian regime has done this so many times for so long that it would be almost foolish for us to wait for them to admit their fault, admit their mistake. That's how they've remained in power, by consistently having an enemy, by consistently wanting to create these stories out of thin air, all the lies and coercion and manipulation. and And so, how can I expect justice from such a regime? I do expect the Canadian government to continue to put pressure on Iran, for European intermediaries to put pressure on Iran. You know, the ones who have more close relations with Iran, Italy, Germany, France, you know, Switzerland, these countries who are acting as bridges for Canada to communicate with Iran, to also continue to put pressure. Iran cannot just do whatever it wants and get away with it that they have to remain accountable and they need to face the consequences for their human rights abuses. This has to stop. I mean, and just statements, you know, aren't enough. There has to be real, measurable, solid action. This is a message that I want to send to families to remain close together, to remain connected, to remain in touch, to be voices for the voiceless and that what you are doing is incredibly courageous, incredibly a gift to so many others who might have also been oppressed by this regime, but did not have the ability to speak up. So the fact that you have such a large campaign, you have raised so much awareness in Canada, in Iran, 
internationally, I think is terrific. And I hope that you continue to do the work that you're doing, even if you might at times feel frustrated, hopeless, and like nothing is working, but I would continue to do exactly what you are doing and you can always count on me. I want to thank Ali Azimi for this beautiful and emotional piece he performed for us. Ali has traveled to Toronto from San Francisco to perform for us today, and we all appreciate all that you, uh, you had to go through to be with us today, despite the circumstances. Ali's COVID test results did not come in time for him to be here, but he's joining us from self-isolation in his hotel room. As we close, another painful chapter on this second anniversary of the downing of Flight PS752. I want to thank you on behalf of the association for being with us today and your continued support. Your solidarity strengthens our resolve to continue our fight for justice by demanding the truth and holding the real perpetrators of this crime accountable. Dr. Ismail Yoon's opening remarks will be replayed in Farsi at the end of this program for those who, want to, who are interested and want to stay on for longer. We will now head over to Melasman Square to hold a candlelight vigil starting at 5 p.m. Eastern time. For our friends in Toronto who wish to come by and pay their tributes to the victims, you are more than welcome to attend this ceremony. We kindly ask that you wear face coverings and observe COVID-19 precautions, including physical distancing. Once again, to our speakers and those who helped us hold this event today, thank you. On this somber day, we hold the memories of the 176 victims of this flight in our hearts. Let us never forget and never forgive.
Hello everyone, I'm Natasha Fata. You're watching CBC News Network and our special coverage of the second anniversary of the downing of flight PS752. All 176 people on board that flight, a Ukrainian International Airlines Flight 752, died. And that includes 55 Canadian citizens and 30 permanent residents. The plane was shot down by Iran's Revolutionary Guard shortly after takeoff. Iran later admitted to shooting it down, blaming human error. Canada and several allies, including Britain, have dismissed that explanation as insufficient and call for a full account from Iran. Attempts to negotiate with Iran towards compensation for the victims and their families has been stalled. The closing remarks at that ceremony were, let us never forget and never forgive. <laughs> 